Welcome to MOOC course on introduction to proteogenomics. In the last lecture by Dr. Bing Zhang, you were introduced to the concept of network analysis with emphasis on protein-protein interactions. In today's lecture, you will be explained the need for network visualization and the various resources available to make sense of the complex data. I am sure you appreciate that not only analysis, but also the data presentation and visualization is very crucial. And in this slide, Dr. Bing Jiang's today's lecture is going to provide you good insight and opportunity to look at various tools available for data visualization. So, let us welcome Professor Bing Jiang for today's lecture. Next, I am going to talk about um, for our ana data analysis and um, what can we use this network to help us. And one way is we use this to um, visualize for visualization and the other way is to do some data analysis. So, I will talk about the network visualization first. Uh, so, network visualization is usually through the load link diagram as we said. And so, each gene or protein is a load and they are connected by an edge. This is called the link. So, it is called load link diagram. And the beauty of this is not only you can see this and then you can overlay data to the network in order to understand your data. right? For example, I am interested in a certain type of proteins in the network. Let us say I am interested in transcription factors and then I can change the shape of the nodes to a triangle shape and then immediately I say okay, those are the transcription factors. And then I can overlay my differential expression result to the network and, and then we can say okay, these genes are up regulated and these are down regulated. So, uh, and there are tools that have been developed to facilitate the network based um, both the network visualization and the network based data visualization. Uh, and this review article in Nature Methods uh, summarizes uh, a lot of um, um, tools that you can use to visualize biological networks. And this is uh, the most popular one is the cytoscape. <laughs> it is very easy to use and very powerful. This is one network um, I did in an earlier publication. And uh, if you um, can, you can also put some artistic uh, 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 change to the network. I mean actually this was also done in the cytoscape and uh, uh, after I did this and this was became a uh, cover of that uh, issue of the journal. I mean, yeah. So, within the cytoscape you can actually do a lot of cool things to realize your uh, network and your data. Um, but there is also challenge. I mean, although the uh, 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 is very good for small networks, but uh, when you have the whole protein-protein interaction network, you want to look um, with I mean, ten thousand nodes and uh, uh, maybe a hundred thousand edges, it's very difficult to see anything. It becomes a hairball again, right? And also, if you want to overlay a lot of different types of data, like in multi-omic study, we want to overlay proteomics, gene expression, copy number, all this data to the network, it becomes challenging. I mean, uh, you can only change the shape, color, but I mean, the lot uh, size, but there are lot, a lot you can do. Um, so, uh, one thing we did um, was to uh, use the hierarchical modular organization. Um, property we learned from the biological network and then try to use that property. So, if we uh, can use uh, this uh, bar to represent the whole, uh, whole network and then we can use a smaller bars to represent each of these sub networks and then we can each of these sub networks can be further organized at smaller modules and eventually we have each of the nodes um, located in uh, under these modules. So, as you can see this is because the way we can do this is because the network is organized in a hierarchical modular um, uh, way right that is what we learned from the network property. The beauty of that is now instead of using two dimension to uh, visualize the network we only use one dimension and uh, this way uh, we can visualize the data uh, on the, uh, in the second dimension either on the paper or in a browser. So, 
I won't go into the detail, but uh, uh, we have the method to convert a network into this and modular structure or uh, hierarchical modular structure and then to uh, uh, also a tool called NetGuest Thought that you can use to um, uh, uh, explore the data next the TCGA data under the uh, this framework. And uh, yeah, uh, finally I want to talk about I mean, we talk about the network visualization, network based uh, data visualization, right? Uh, so, um, at the end, I want to talk about how we can use this network to help analyze our own data. Um, so, this is basically based on the observation that the nodes in the network are not random, again, not randomly connected. Usually, uh, <coughs> genes or proteins that are functionally similar to each other are more likely to be connected to each other in the network. As you can see in this plot, like if we have a way to quantify the uh, functional similarity between two proteins uh, and then we can see the uh, protein pairs that are directly connected to each other meaning they are one step from each other. They have much higher average functional similarity than the protein pairs that have uh, shortest pass lengths uh, of 8 or above. Uh, as you can see this relationship is very obvious. So, by leveraging this observation, so we can come up with a few different ways uh, help us to uh, do either predicting gene function or prioritizing genes in our studies. Um, so, first we can use uh, because we know that direct labels are more likely to share the same function. Uh, we can explore the direct interaction partners of the uh, uh, proteins in the network. And then the second approach is uh, we can divide uh, use some graph algorithms to try to separate the networks into modules. We know there are modules in the network right and then we expect that the uh, proteins in the same module will likely to share similar uh, structure or uh, share similar uh, function. And the last method is called the diffusion based approach. Uh, so, uh, I think this is a very local method that you only focus on the direct relationship. Uh, this is a relatively more global um, uh, method you explore the module, but the diffusion based approach basically try to explore the whole network as a whole system. I think this is probably a more powerful approach. Uh, so, we can sh uh, I can show you a few examples to help you to understand this approach. Um, let us say if uh, we uh, this is a small protein protein interaction network let us say and then we know uh, the red proteins meaning protein have function A and then the blue proteins these are the protein uh, associated with function B. And then we have other proteins in the network that we do not know what they do in the network and then we try to use this network to help us to predict what are the functions uh, of this network do they more likely to have the red function or have the blue function. And uh, if we do a direct neighborhood analysis, so basically for each node we can count how many red labels we, uh, it has and how many blue labels it has and through this we can assign the function through a majority voting uh, algorithm. So, basically uh, if there are more uh, red labels then it is red and if there are more blue lab labels then it is blue. So, this is very easy to implement and you can quickly get the function of the proteins. But one limitation of this approach is that and because the, these three proteins we basically have no idea about their functions at the beginning, but maybe for some proteins like this guy. Uh, we are pretty sure it is more likely to be a red protein, but for others it is less clear right. So, you can also think about doing this in an iterative way. So, let us say you do a um, you have an intermediate step here you make a, a temporary assignment for example, this is to pink meaning it is more likely to need to be red and this is a light blue meaning it is more likely to be blue than red. But after that you re after this you re uh, for the gray proteins you recount do the recounting and in this case we can see this protein get to uh, then to a red function rather than a blue function. So, it uh, so this iterative process can 
better leverage more information than just the uh, using the original neighborhood analysis. And uh, we can also use a module based approach to do this. For example, uh, in this case we only have one protein with unknown function and then we want to assign the function here and if you do the neighborhood counting and then you will see one, two, three, four here and one, two, three here you will think, think maybe this protein or, uh, is a blue protein. Uh, but if you do a module based approach and especially if you have a method that can allow the module to have overlapping members and then you can have a module like this one, two, three modules and then this basically is a, a module dominated by red proteins and this is a module dominated by blue proteins. Then you can probably think okay this protein might have both functions if we use this and that is more likely to be true right. Uh, a protein a lot of times may have multiple functions depending on what it interacts with in a specific condition. So, and the diffusion based approach this is particularly useful in uh, gene prioritization. Let us say if you do a high throughput study and then you get a uh, let us say we do a GWA study we may come up with multiple SNPs or SNPs associated genes that are associated with the phenotype or if you do a differential proteomics analysis you come up with 20 proteins or 10 proteins that are very likely to be associated with the phenotype. Uh, and then you want to do experiments next step right, but which protein to choose to do the uh, knockout experiment if you have a hundred candidate it is very difficult to know. Uh, so, uh, the network based approach can help us to um, uh, prioritize. So, let us see these are the candidates we have and then we can map them to the network and after you map to the network um, you can use a um, process called uh, random work process. So, basically we can imagine and each node is a person let us say uh, I am a person. So, I start from here from the red node and then uh, if you just uh, take random work uh, at each step to the next node for example, at the first step I can go either here or here or here or here right. But after you go here I have the next step I can go here or here or here or here or here. So, but you can use uh, some um, uh, iterative updating process and then you at the steady state they should end up they have the probability to end up somewhere. So, let us say if you start from here then at the steady state I may have higher probability to end here or here or here right. Uh, and then we can calculate if we start from uh, can from uh, start from all the uh, each of these 10 nodes what is the probability of ending on a particular protein. And then you sum that, that up and then you get the steady state probability for ending at that protein and then I use the color shade to indicate the probability and as we can see here uh, and if we start with this 10 possible positions where we are likely to end in this area, but uh, it is also possible to end in these areas. So, anyway I mean uh, for the 10 proteins you can probably see ok these 4 proteins are more important than the other proteins. Uh, and also this might sometimes help you to identify new genes in not included especially in let us say in proteomics uh, we have a lot of missing um, uh, identifications right. For example, this might be a low abundant protein and now you see maybe this is I mean, somewhat uh, pot possibly important protein. So, let us see some real world application of this method. Um, so, in this study I mean, the, uh, I, uh, through a GWA study let us say you identified a lot of uh, genes or uh, the SNPs associated with these genes that are potentially to be important uh, or candidate genes for uh, disease. But let us say you also have uh, prior knowledge on which genes you already know to be associated with disease. Now, uh, you have a protein protein interaction network and then you can map all the long genes and the new genes in the network. And then if we go through the uh, diffusion process we can estimate if we just start from this node the uh, known uh, disease related genes 
and then what's the probability of ending on this uh, pro, uh, proteins. And then we get a new score for these proteins and uh, based on this process we can rank and you would expect the uh, gene 3 will I mean, very likely to be a disease related protein than this uh, uh, gene 1 right. So, this is very easy to understand. Um, and also uh, we used this for in a study for gene signature prior, uh, prioritization. Um, so, I, uh, we worked with another group um, so basically to try to develop uh, gene expression signatures uh, for colon cancer, but we are just one group to do this study and there are many group because this is an important question colon cancer uh, gene expression signature and there are seven published studies on this topic. But if we look at the gene signatures reported by these seven studies, um, they do not overlap actually you see very little overlap about uh, of the gene signatures reported by these studies. So, then we um, we were thinking I mean what is causing this discrepancy is it because just uh, all these are uh, incorrect identifications or there are some possible other explanations. So, one way to think about this is maybe and uh, if this is a network and each study may and this is a network that is actually driving colon cancer poor prognosis and each study may identify some of the important components uh, in the network, but maybe they did not get all the uh, important nodes, but also they observe some other proteins that are not critical to this network, but they just uh, co-vary um, with those uh, nodes. So, for example, gene signature 1 may only identify this and gene signature 2 only identify this. So, if you would only do the overlapping they have no overlap, but if you map all those signatures to the network uh, we will be able to identify maybe it is this region that is important. Um, and the similar idea is I mean, uh, not only this is only for mRNA based gene signature study right, but a protein uh, activity can be altered at multiple levels at the DNA level the, the mutate for example, this protein it can be the activity of the protein can be altered by mutations or copy number alterations or mRNA uh, this, uh, the expression change or protein expression change or PTM modification all these can potentially alter, uh, alter the uh, protein activity and the if uh, Protein, act, uh, protein activity in this important network is altered in a sample, then you are going to see potentially a phenotype right. So, um, that means if we have uh, multi omic studies, we can also map all the uh, observations to the network that can also help us to prioritize the uh, uh, findings from those studies. One example is and uh, we again uh, collected all the gene expression signatures from the seven studies and also we collected all the mutations in colon cancer and then we mapped those to a protein protein interaction network and then we uh, through the network algorithm. So, basically it is a uh, network diffusion algorithm we talk about and then we get a new list of proteins that are important not only because of their differential expression mutation, but also because of their uh, um, kind of centralized location in certain part of the important part of the network. And then we were able to come up with a prediction models based on those signatures um, and then we were able to show that the signature you get this way has better um, uh, reproducibility when you apply to a new cohort than the I mean, gene expression signatures you started I mean from individual studies. Dr. most of the network analysis Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. So, how robust are the computational tools to pick them up because they are not as soon as they stand out in the experimental and how well representative are these databases as far as these interactions are concerned? Yeah, that's a very good question. So, uh, if you go to BioGrid, for example, you download all the protein protein interaction in the database. 
and that is basically the collection of all the possible interactions that has ever been reported in any of the publications. It could be in a disease state, it could be in after EGFR treatment or it, the, it's not condition dependent. So, basically you get is a map, it is just like a Google map with everything on the map, but you do not have uh, context dependent information. So, there are a few different ways to do address this. For example, you can try to build your own conditional specific network through experiments. You can do pull down or uh, like uh, yeah, you have to do pull down in the specific condition or you can also try to leverage some gene co-expression information. For example, if you are interested in uh, colon cancer, you can take a look at the colon cancer co-expression and try to overlay or integrate the co-expression information in that condition with a big protein protein um, co uh, interaction network and try to get some conditional specific network. That is actually a very active research area and the people are trying to develop algorithms to uh, come up with context specific interaction networks rather than just the, the this global. Um, but, I think that provides still provides you a m reference map that you can uh, to uh, start to derive condition specific networks, but that is a very important question. Yeah. But can we predict the uh, interactions on the basis of a primary sequence? Um, well, I think yeah, yeah you, of course, you can you can do the prediction based on the sequence. I mean that is for example, one approach I talk about the domain based approach and basically uh, if you see two type and, and I think people are start to use deep learning. Uh, actually, some people in my lab are doing this type of analysis. They try to leverage the deep learning, and then when you have enough training uh, models, and then you can use that uh, as a, a training examples, and then to see how can we use deep learning or typical machine learning approach to capture the sequence features that can help you to predict. Yes, and the sequences are also important in predicting. So yeah. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. I think people are and there are some recent uh, deep learning based methods they try to incorporate the, in, uh, the linear sequence and also the protein uh, structure information and some domain information as features to predict. In today's lecture, we learnt about the importance of network visualization and interpretation of complex data. We also learned that proteins connected next to each other usually have a higher functional similarity. This forms the basis for network analysis tools. If the aim is to predict gene function, the network based methods like module based approach and neighborhood majority voting can be used to get important leads. The diffusion based approach is used to get information on gene priority in a network and network visualization tools like Cytoscape and NetJetStart are widely used in clinical studies. I hope these two lectures and various tools which Dr. Bing Jiang showed have been helpful to you to now try use your own data set or publicly available data set and try to create the various networks and visualize them using these tools. Thank you.